And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, <laughs> the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Sons of the Singularity, creators of the upcoming Between the Devil and the Deep, and thus our first our, our first gumshoe entry in the in this channel in a while. The one and only Jesse Kovner. How are you doing today, man? Or tonight, in your case. Yeah, I'm in Japan, and I'm doing great, and thank you for having me on the show. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, thank you for coming on. Um, so, I'd like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Um, could you walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick? Uh, well, um, I consider myself to be quite young. I mean, actually, I think that I have like the spirit of an. 16 year old or a 14 year old in a body i like to think of a 24 year old body but probably that's not most people don't see it that way i am actually it uh a little bit more than half a century old <laughs> so uh my first introduction i was probably uh the first time i saw it was on a a beach in something that was called surf camp i think i was 11 and I saw my camp counselor playing what I believe uh, later on, I believe he was actually playing um, Keep on the Borderlands mm -hmm. uh, and saw the dice. And I instantly understood this game that I saw, even though he wouldn't explain anything to me and he told me to F off. Um, but, and, but when I got back from camp, uh, and not knowing how to surf after going to surf camp, but I did go and uh, buy a D and D set. Um, loved it. Didn't have anyone to play. And then I went to sixth grade uh, right after that. Uh, and met some of uh, four friends of mine uh, who stayed my friends uh, for a long time, for all my life, um, even though they were all in different parts of the world. Um, and played with them. And I went through a, a, a uh, so that was like my, my first experience for seeing it, just, just sort of like seeing it and just getting it mm -hmm. and very clearly and, and, uh, knew that that I had to play it. But I gotta say, I, I had sworn off, uh, role-playing games from the time I was 20 or so, 20, maybe 24 until, like in my 40s i didn't play a game i didn't open a book i didn't even think about it um i didn't play again until i was like in i was in china in a in a starbucks and i saw these two guys talking about uh role-playing games and i went up to them and said hey i just heard you talking i'd like to sit in and talk with you guys and they became my friends and um uh met other people who were ro role players and in china and eventually one of my friends um, and i helped out a lot with this um, created one of the first role-playing game conventions in china which we called con con as in genghis khan khan um and um that started i i don't know how many years now that was that must have been like i guess eight years ago it started off first time was 40 people we had sort of a caligula con before that of of raunchy parting the night before the actual con con um and uh now that festival was uh i'm not really associated with it or go to it anymore because I've, i haven't been in china for five years or so six years but uh now there's like more than a thousand people and they're holding it in two cities and the people who are running it are friends of mine so it was cool not only it was cool to be uh to get reintroduced to the hobby that i had loved when i was younger um and be a part of of and be around people who are introducing it to others mm -hmm. now with between with um between the devil and the deep mm -hmm. oh that is go that is going for a that is going for a pirate theme in the in the Caribbean in, I believe, um, 1691. 
Correct. Oh. Now, you de the way you the way you describe things definitely I definitely get a lot of history buff leanings. Was that was that one of the reasons you went to, you went that particular route, or was there another reason that you went with um po that you went with this particular theme? You mean you mean the the historical bent to it? Um, a little a little bit of that, and just a, and just a glorified way of saying why pirates. <laughs> oh well, um, so this is like my fifth Kickstarter, and uh, and the the way that our pattern seems to be, for better or worse, is that we've done something. Um, and so I have a partner in my company, so we're the sons. My partner's name is Jason Sheets. And mm -hmm. He's a, uh, and uh, we uh, sort of like my evil twin. We're both left handed, we're around the same age group. We both speak Chinese, we both um moved to J left uh, China around the same time, moved to Japan. We we started our company together. Um, his first project and my first project, our first two uh, um, Kickstarters were started off as long-term passion projects. I did uh, Rational Magic, and he did one was called Sassoon Files. Sassoon Files sort of got a little bit famous because the Chinese, because we printed it in China and the government um, destroyed the first print run. Um, and then you know, and we, we do so, we did something we we did something for uh, for uh, pleasure. We do something that was for pleasure and money, and then we do something for pleasure and do something for pleasure and money. So after soon files, we did the Camlin Chronicles, which was his long running uh, D and D cam Arthurian D and D campaign, mm -hmm. and then and uh, and then we did. Journal the Indochine, which is Call of Cthulhu. Uh, it was our most successful Kickstarter, and we did that uh, Call of Cthulhu based in the colonial Vietnam. And then after going through all that and spending a lot of time, uh, Jason was like, I want to play a game. I don't want to GM anymore. And I was like, let's do something we didn't do before. Let's do pirates, and let's see if we could fit pirates into gumshoe. And so it started off like that as a just sort of a, a very um, let's just have fun pirates yarha. But you know we always like putting his history into it. We're always researching it. We're always trying to be sort of genuine. And so you know as we were playing the campaign, this fun in between campaigns, um, we started. I started building it up more. I was like you know we this is a great thing. I like this more than I like this a lot. And I want to you know, publish it and share it with people. And so that's what I'm doing. Um, it's a, it's an in-between project and, it, you know, who knows, maybe it becomes a main project. I, I like it a hell of a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, our next two projects are probably going to be Call of Cthulhu projects, which, um, and uh, in, in the Asian horror series that we've been doing. And then after that, we'll probably go to a, you know, again, do a sort of like a fun for passion, see see what we can do. Thing. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I hope I'm not like rambling on. No, about... no, no, no. I al I always ex I. This is one of the things I always ex I always expect, and I always look f I always look forward to. Um, okay. So, gi given that you guys have you guys have dipped into you guys have dipped into five E and basic essentially basic role playing um, yeah. in the past. And now you're now you're venturing into the gumshoe system, um, mm -hmm. like. And what what I'm curious about is what 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 led to the choice of using gum of using gumshoe, in particular. Uh, okay. Well. Um, okay. This is going to sound a little weird. Um, I'm not a fan of D and D, and I'm not a fan of generic of of the of the sort of gen, the feeling of generic fantasy, or of the system. You're in good company here. <laughs> okay. Um, I, um, I, but I'm I'm a little bit of of a, actually a crunchy player. I I love traveler. I love old style, um, traveler. Um, actually, and basically. 
we actually play almost everything in gumshoe first because uh, all of our all of our call of cthulhu stuff we first do in gumshoe we 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 come about it uh come at it with a um based on the organizing principles that uh for the for scenarios that that is taught in in trail of cthulhu we've added our own sort of organizing principles for how to organize and run a campaign um that that links together several scenarios and um when we when i started to do when I started to do uh, Between the Devil and the Deep, it was sort of natural to do Gumshoe because it's what uh, it's what Jason and I have been playing for six years. And I'm not like that big a fan of, of Gumshoe either. It's a little too simple for me, but it's it's basically the game. Like so a lot of people, a lot of GMs you may hear of, oh, my groups only want to do D&D and I can't get them to do anything else. Well, um, <laughs> my group only wants to do gumshoe <laughs> and and so i said you know gumshoe in some ways is a, in some ways is a traditional game um in in ways that people don't really think it's a traditional game but i think it's a traditional game in many ways and um if i put if i roll two dice instead of one die and and um i could make this look a lot like traveler that would make me feel better um and we could you know instead of doing it in space we do it on ships and uh we could have uh pirates but we could also throw in well-researched campaign and it just sort of took off from there and then i sort of took out some of the additions and homebrew stuff for publication because we want when we publish we want to um get as many people within within that platform that we can that we can appeal to so um you know and we haven't really done a gumshoe only product before we're going to do several gumshoe only products we're gonna do a lot of gum product uh, only products in the near future probably but for right now um we wanted our first gumshoe only uh game to be uh more standard uh uh and uh so that's uh we put it together that way mm -hmm. um i think i think what else f i find interesting regarding the choice of using gumshoe is gumshoe's reputation is that is that of more investigative style play like the the, the yeah. Yeah. if i play if i play mm -hmm. word association when it comes to gumshoe when it comes to gumshoe the the um two na the two names that a lot that a lot of people will bring up are um Trail of Cthulhu of course and mm -hmm. the Esoterrorists. I was gonna say Knights Black Agents. I, I would have thought the Knights Black Agents as well. I'd say those would be the big. Yeah. I'd say those would be the big three that people would associate. And yeah, it's uh, obvious. Obviously, all three of those are, are first party. But the po the point is, you look at a lot of it. You look at a lot of entries in the in gum in um gumshoe and they're very much in that investigative approach mm -hmm. there are so, there are some ha there are some hacks that are that are going to be a little bit more actiony like say mutant city blues which is a soup which is a superhero game and and uh, sir, uh uh swords of the serpentine mm -hmm. am i getting right right yeah swords of the serpentine mm-hmm God, I'm I'm so bad with proper names, and and then if I if I miss if I miss it, and and then his they're gonna go like, wow, he can't even remember the name of my game. Uh, anyway, <laughs> to that to that, um, I, to that I say you try and you try and remember a specific a specific name, and you got when you got billions of names in your head. <laughs> um, but the point the point is is that the point is 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 that. A lot, is that a lot of a lot of people look at it as a more as a more investigative thing? Yep. And I I, I know where you're going with this. I uh... it's um, <laughs> and people people don't usually think of investigation when they think of pirates and swash and buckle. Yeah. So how so how do you um how do so you how do you here's... manage the two sides? Yeah. Um. Great question. Um. So there's there's a there's a couple of parts to that. 
Um, one is that I think that investigation is in, I wouldn't say all uh, RPGs, but I think it's actually the core component of, of a lot of even D&D. Even it's a lot of, you know, what do I see there? How do I, how do I uh, figure this out? Who do I talk to? I think the investigation is just in in RPGs, and so I don't really see that that, and that was actually something that I wanted to prove. I wanted to show that you know all the stuff that you that you do with investigation and trail, you could do in any game, and any game could do it in trail. And we, I play trail, um, and it doesn't feel different for me. I mean, it feels a lot better to me in many ways than D and D. It feels infinitely better than D and D for me personally. It's just my own style, but I don't feel like the game loop is is different. The, at least the way that I play it, anyway. Um, there's there's always like trying to find out what's going on. There's always moving the spotlight around. Mm-hmm. There's always. Um, you know, different different games um, have different philosophies about about how to show the, the the character's competence, and Gumshoe shows that competence um, uh, much more definitively. Like if you have this point in this, you could do this, and there's no question that you can can or cannot do that. Um, but that's actually how when I do play D and D, that's actually how I play D and D as well. Um, so I don't, I don't see in that sense, um, I don't see a, a conundrum with that. Uh, I want to say dichotomy, but that may be the, uh, I'm finding big words that are actually used improperly. I, I just don't see a, a conundrum with, with this. Um, so with, uh, and, and, you know, we bake it into the, we bake gumshoe into, into everything in between the devil and the deep. We, we have, uh, we have to, to find a ship that you want to attack. You, you, you know, you have to use investigative skills to do that. Mm-hmm. You have to, you have to find the clues to find the ship to, um, and there's a lot more to it than that. There's, um, there's using skills to do uh, point spends uh, it, with your pirate haven. There's using point spends in combat to, uh, and talk about investigative skills, point spends in combat to um, to take narrative control to explain how you're using a poem to motivate your 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 or a sea shanty to motivate your crew. Uh, to to say how you intimidate uh, an NPC or how you use leadership to inspire or how you use tactics or whatever. So um, yeah, I don't I don't see a a real uh, I don't I don't see any sort of contradictions there. I know that there's a feeling that there's a you know that what you express is sort of a feeling there's a contradiction. I want to dispel that, and you know, and, and here's here's just an example of how uh, of I don't want to say it's unfair because it's, you know there are many things in the world that are unfair. I don't want to like go into fairness, but no one ever says when when people use D and D to to do investigation, or they use D and D to do political dramas, or they use D and D to do horror. All things that you that people have done, and it may not be the best system for it, but people do it with that system. No one says, "Oh, why are you playing this game if you're doing investigation?" Right? No one says that about about that game and and how they use different that game in in different ways. So I don't think that anyone. I think that it's sort of a little bit silly or limiting to the actual game and a disservice to the game to 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 tr- you know try to limit the game to a very narrow field. Now that being said, I know that Pelgrane um, positions within their internal product line with the things that they do with the game, they want it to be focused for themselves, for their gumshoe products, like trail. And that's that's their positioning and that's a good positioning, you know, to show to, to make it known 
at least for the, how they use it to be used and known for that. But I don't think it's right that other people you know, need to limit themselves in how they use the system. Mm-hmm. And with and to be to be fair, well, while, while I um, while I advocate a bit of a a bit of a tailor's mentality with how I cut co- with how I cover games, mm-hmm. um, a, a bit of a what mentality? Tailor. A tailor, huh? Um, like if if in any of, in any of in any of the reviews I've done over the year done over the years, um, except for my really early ones that I'm not a fan of. Um, I don't u- I don't use a scoring system. I use it kind of a tier system, mm-hmm. and it's more about who more about who or who or what styles I'd rec- I'd recommend certain games to. Because while it, while um while while a lot of people can say that you can use that you can use a game to run anything, um mm-hmm. the fact of the matter is some th- some things that people may want to run are going to require a bit more elbow grease than others. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um. So I can get, I can definitely get, I can definitely get that when it comes, definitely get um, the desire to push back against certain, certain idea, certain ideas when it comes to, when it comes, when it comes to gumshoe, um, mm-hmm. and I do, I do remember that one, I do remember that one of the reasons gumshoe was created was, was in regard to those investigative scenes, um, the issue of the issue of narrative stops. When a f- when a failed roll happens, uh, the the failed door, the failed mm-hmm. gate. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's had their story about having a war on the door where they tr- where they tried to break the door down and they, and they can't. Yeah, I you know I played I started playing Call of Cthulhu again recently, relatively recently. I mean, I played it whatever thirty years ago. And um, when I started publishing Call of Cthulhu games, I started uh, playing it. And uh, it was this one, you know, we're, we're playing a bunch of Vietnamese, uh, North Vietnamese agents infiltrating a, 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 a Japanese occupied city. And we all fail every single damn roll of things that we should be okay at. <laughs> and and it became sort of like a comedy of errors you know which was fun in a way it was fun but i was like oh my god we're failing every single damn row we're, we're failing and it's like it's like this is we're in this high stakes situation you know and it just it didn't exactly um the way that the, in that one scene it didn't feel right in, in the combat scene it felt great uh, with but in that one scene where we're just like, yeah, and 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 by failing it though, it caused us all to have to roll. Uh, you know, oh, I failed it. Now you try it. it. And then when we all failed it, we had to take another another route, and that was cool, mm-hmm. right? So, um. So yeah, I mean, I mean, one thing that Gumshoe does, at least for the in to get the clues, is that it it sort of. Uh, it sort of takes the uh, it it sort of makes you pass the door. If the GM puts a door and decides that the the players need to get through that door, there isn't any fiddling around with it. The players get through the door. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that I I wrote out because I had to rewrite the you know not rewrite but I had to include the gumshoe rules in the game, so I had to take from the SRD. And, you know, I want to put some of the things in the SRD in there to show people, hey, this is this is standard gumshoe. Um, But I wrote um, the rules about about how to deal with with clues, which is which is really about the idea of getting through that door, that gate. And, you know, I wrote, you know, finding key clues doesn't require a role. Um, You know, if the GM. uh, um, And. And. but the GM wants to make the players roll to see if they're complications. The GM can do that. And if, uh, and if the players don't have the right ability or saying they're not using the right ability, the GM can say um, that they don't get it. They have to figure out what the right ability is. And if the GMs want the, the players, not the characters, but the players to figure out a puzzle or a clue, the G, you know, that's, 
that's also that's also okay too. So you just the only issue is that you can't, you're not going to roll uh you know 50 times to find until one person around the table gets the roll to to get through. That's that's not the that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, yeah. sorry I'm rambling on again. <laughs> <laughs> again, again, don't worry. Again, don't okay. worry about that. Um, okay. Now, when it when it comes to when it comes to creating and playing pirate characters in in Gumshoe's setup, um, mm -hmm. aside aside from having a particular skill list dedicated to well playing pi playing pirates and pirate adjacent things, are there any are there any major dif any major differences in character creation compared to uh, compared to the standard fare with Gumshoe, in character creation, I don't. Uh, well, no, there is actually one big difference. Um, so I have, we have two system agnostic systems. System agnostic systems. I gotta <laughs> think of a better wording for that. Um, we have two things that we put into into every single one of our games. We started, and this these are things that we we have put into from the very first game that we published. Uh, these are one is called lore shoots and one is called risk counters. Mm -hmm. Risk counters are similar to like clocks in uh, uh, between the devil and the deep. And, and that's no, that's my game. They're similar to clocks in uh, blades in the dark. Not exactly, um, but um, but you could think of it a little bit like that. Um, the lore sheets are are um, handouts that have backgrounds, and the thing about a lore sheet where we write it up it could be two paragraphs it doesn't have to be a background it could be anything it could be about uh, a relationship of a character has with something in the game world um and we usually use that to also write in history historical elements in it or or settings element into it um the way that i like to think of that is like in the uh, Assassin's Creed video game if you've ever played that before um, in the very f first one or the second one um, while you know you're you're going around the city and the game will will like have a pop up hey by the way this is a this is a uh, a building that was actually used by Leonardo da Vinci to, to do something and you're like oh okay that's cool they just gave me a piece of history with that and now i have a feeling of that i'm in a place that's important so a lore sheet is like two paragraphs and mechan a uh, handout that they attach to the character sheet mm -hmm. and mechanically offers advantage of in gumshoe it has basically one investigative point so you can tap we call it tap the lore sheet basically you could spend the point on anything instead of it spending a point on the investigative ability of, I don't know, intimidation or the investigative ability of um, archaeology, you, you you have a point that you could spend on anything that is remotely described on the sheet. Mm -hmm. There's a very free-form um, uh, aspect. And um, it, it is a little bit like aspects in fate, only, only written out instead of a few words it's written out as a, as a big paragraph and the players can create their own war sheets but we provide this in our books um to for the characters to tie in uh, as as specific to a character we also provide lore sheets that are specific to parts in the in in different adventures so that someone can can print out um cut out the lore, the gm i mean can cut out the lore sheet um, offer it to the player. The player can refuse it if they don't want to, because the player is is has command, has remit over their own character's history and connections. So, but the GM could say, "Hey, um, you said your character was from Port Royal. Well, I have a lore sheet because Port Royal, and it describes on it um, some things about Port Royal, and also describes in it um, a guy who um, a." Uh, a tavern owner um, that will give you connection. Maybe you can use it for to 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 your benefit. Do you want it? And the and the player can say yes or no. Yeah. So that is one different. That's the only real difference, I would say, in, in character creation between um, 
between the Devil in the Deep and mm -hmm. other games. Yeah. Now, when it comes now, um, when it comes to ship to ship rules, mm -hmm. this is this is one of the this is one of those things where it's where it's all where there's going to be a degree of <clears throat> trick of trickiness to make sure that um, maintain uh, maintaining a ship in combat isn't uh, isn't too crunchy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're no you're no stranger to crunch be, being being a survivor of Traveler's character creator, but um, but but I think but obviously there has to there have to be limits. You know, I haven't uh, played Traveler in thirty five years. I don't even remember it. Although I remember that my characters often died during character creation process. I didn't think it was really crunchy or difficult though. Yeah, no, I'm, I no, understand. I'm, I'm, you, refer yeah. I'm referring to I'm referring to the fact that when it comes to managing ship combat, it's yeah. very tempting to go to go extremely de extremely detailed. But if you end up yep. going that down that route, you're going to go down the route of Phoenix Command, and nobody wants that. What's I've never heard of Phoenix Command, but uh, that that doesn't say anything. I haven't heard of a lot of things. So, um, <laughs> short version: Phoenix Command is is one of my whipping boys when it comes to going too far on the on the crunch end of things. Uh huh. Um, it was used as the basis for the first attempt at an a at an Aliens RPG. Um. It's hmm. not well liked. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, er, you know, um, originally the very first um, crack at it, I had gotten, I had tried to uh, to be simple and it got complex and I didn't like it and I, and I scrapped it. Um, but from the start, I wanted to do something that uses the risk counters and risk counters are um, basically um, a table that has descriptions on it and numbers so if you're like at risk counter four uh it'll say you know you could start parlay and 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 you do things to advance the counter risk counters and progress counters so when you advance the counter um, and you, how do you advance a counter? Well, sailing or maneuver counters is, is done with the navigation general ability, which is a which is a roll, a skill roll, and and if you and if you succeed, you roll a d6 and you add your sales points. But other than that, all of the investigative skills can cause a roll that you know basically, if you if you spend your point and you. Um, and you describe what is happening, um, and the, and everyone th says that 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 your description is not like particularly outrageous, um, or defies game world logic. Then they, the GM gives it, and you just roll the dice and you add it to the to the risk counter. So you could use spell, you could use stealth in your maneuver counter. Um, you know, disguise the ship. You could use um, disguise. You could use. Uh, um, you can use voodoo. You can use um, you could you can uh, use natural philosophy to, to the point to, to to say you know there's no wind because we are in the you know at this time in the Car Caribbean. Um, so the other ship uh, is 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 where we're both like moving very slow, but here I'm going to use my athletics general ability and here you'd have to roll a dice to uh, get the crew out into the rowboats and row the and you know uh, drag the ship be, uh, from the rowboats and then you could use intimidation um, ability to add to that counter and say okay we're gonna whip ourselves to to uh, move faster to get to get away from this other ship or use leadership to inspire the crew to row faster so um basically it comes down to just like anything else in gumshoe you either make a test with general ability or you spend a point of your investigative ability um and and when you when you're successful in the test or when you just spend a point um you add 1d6 to a relevant um, counter. Mm -hmm. There are three counters. There's a, what's called a maneuver counter, and at different stages, different things happen. There's what we call a ship shape counter, which is basically the status, of the physical status of the ship, and that's a risk counter. As as that goes up, bad things happen. 
to your ship, you lose you 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 lose hands, which is your abstraction of sailors, or you maybe you lose your sails. And then there's a boarding counter, and the boarding counter is is used when you're actually getting into the uh, into boarding action, and you know you, you're you're maneuvered counters to the point where you could do that, and you say you could do it, and then and then it just becomes a battle scene um, with different you could say subtasks um and this is like a battle as in you know any other battle except as you as you achieve your subtasks you add you roll on the on the boarding counter risk uh table and that adds the risk to of that ship and eventually the other ship they either lose all of their sailors or they um or they give up so it's it it looks um it looks more complicated than standard gumshoe but all it is 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 a table and you which is really all that hit points are mm-hmm. in in anything as well they're like hit there it's a it's a clock and we use three clocks with a clock for maneuver a clock for the risk taken to your ship and a clock for uh a clock for to 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 illustrate the overall progress of a battle. And we give examples of things that you could do to, to, to make that clock turn in the, in the boarding battle, you know, uh, uh, striking the colors, uh, you know, lowering the opponent's flag, killing their lieutenants, sneaking your way in um, to the base of the, to the, to the hull of the ship and planting a, a, a grenade in the gunpowder stores. Um, uh, doing something that's outrageous, all of these things are, are you know, just uh, give players hints of narrative things that they do, and they role play it like any other traditional scene, mm-hmm. traditional RPG game scene. You know, not different than if it was in, well, less complicated with with the actual combat rules because it's gumshoe, but not actually that different in in principle from between Dungeons and Dragons or Call of Cthulhu or Savage Worlds or anything. Mm-hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, mm-hmm. um, I'd like to I'd like to I'd like to ask a bit about voodoo magic. Mm-hmm. And and how and how that and how that would work out. Is it a case where where it would be, it would be a skill, or is it a case where you have? Well, I, I so I sort of answered my own question since voodoo is a investigative ability. Um, Actually, there's there's a there's a general ability called spell casting, and so the general ability is used for any time where the GM thinks that this needs a roll, mainly combat. Or you know things where there's risk uh, when there's when there's risk of uh, of danger and where. Um, but other than that, there is the the voodoo is a is also a voodoo itself is an uh, investigative ability, and so you're spending it to for the player to basically take narrative control. Um, we have a list of of uh, a more of a general list of like what does powers you know spending one point or two points or three points of of this type of ability what type of effect it can generally get but we also have pages of spells um you know that are more precise examples but are still very like you know the player is taking narrative narrative control when when they spend a point of this so this is generally what would happen now it's up to the player to explain how that all works mm-hmm. and so i'm get, and with that with that in mind i'm guessing that there isn't going to be a lengthy <laughs> um, spe- um spell or ritual list when it comes to vo- when it comes to using voodoo i have i have i think three pages of it um so um because because if we if I didn't provide that, then then no one would really understand or have any sort of voodoo feel, right? There, um, voodoo is is one thing I haven't achieved yet, and I still have have a little bit of work to do on this. Is 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 the concept of of the luas riding the the the, the uh, 
the mambo mm -hmm. um which is which is part of 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 voodoo religions but i mean i've i've sort of mapped um a, a, a many of the the loas to certain effects um certain things that they would do you know mm -hmm. some spells would would uh and and also to, uh, taking from from stories of f folk tales of what uh, what voodoo uh, mambas did and um sort of creating descriptions of that because otherwise otherwise then you no know, yeah i can give players a uh, a list of general like generic power ranges but if they don't have if they have no knowledge of, of voodoo they would not really have any idea of how to flavor it and thereby put it into the into the narrative so i'm trying to do both the two two worlds which i hope it comes out okay Okay. which is one is is sort of like a, a power range you spend one point you could sort of do this one two points you could sort of do that three points you could sort of do that but at the same time i also give three pages of of examples of one point two point and three point spells mm -hmm. now with that with that in with that in mind uh when it comes to when it comes to the pirate havens rule i'm guessing Pirate Havens would be the akin of, of holdings in other games? I don't know what a holding is, but I'm going to guess that's correct. Um, um, holding is just, is just my is just my catch -all, is just the catch all that I use when it comes to um, when it come, whether it be a castle, whether it be a wizard's tower in in, in fantasy games, whether it be uh, a yeah. whether it be a state in some in some games. Basically, some sort of base that the players have. Yes. Yeah, that's 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 described. The the rules for holding are actually, um, I think that I I would say that they're gumshoe rules that haven't been like codified. If that makes sense, um, they were taken from a book called from a from a game called um, Book Hounds of London, and um, basically it's it's again it's it's players spending their. Uh, um, their investigative abilities uh, to create a pool. So you say if you, you have uh, a weapons, not just investigate any ability. So if you have a weapon skill, and you spend, you take one of those point, you you take a build point and you and you invest it into this haven. It becomes three points. You say, well, I have, I have um, a weapon skill and a cherry in British, uh, you know. British style fencing. So I create a, you know, a fencing school at my Haven. Okay. So that one build point, one character point becomes now something, a three point pool that anyone in can use. Um, and through, and we have like, um, you know, various sort of cut out like parts of this, like, mm -hmm. Here's a flag. If if you spend a build point on here, then you create three points um, pool associated with flag. But the players have to design the flag. Here is um, shipyard. You could spend one build point, um, assuming the player has the the shipwright ability. Um, this will become a three point pool and also give some other special um, benefits. But the GM may tell you that you have to first find and role play. And investigate and find um, a certain shipwright that can move to your pirate haven and work there. So um, it becomes, and th this is this is similar. This was um, we call this an endowment because you're endowing your the, your own personal's build point to create a multiplier effect to create a, a larger level of pool. That's the all the mechanical parts of it. There's also you know there's also just the narrative parts of it that you have this this haven there's another mechanical part in it and that is to refresh all of your build points i'm sorry your your points your not your build points but you just your general skill your ability points you have to um you have to wind up at a haven not necessarily your own haven a place where you can relax and drink and booze and carouse 
um, and we call that a, a debauchery event where you can en engage in debauchery and thereby your points would be um, uh, refreshed. Mm -hmm. um, but that becomes more difficult because, you know, your pirate havens are potentially under attack at times and, and they're, you know, they're people out to get you. There's the, they're the, the great powers and then there are supernatural forces also that may be out to get you. Mm -hmm. And that, when it comes to the, when it comes to the supernatural end of, end of things, um, I'm guess I'm guessing I'm guessing that's in its own se that's in its own section in case somebody wants to go strictly strictly um historical fantasy instead of br instead of bringing in the we the weirder parts of of this kind of setting. Actually, no. It's I mean it it is in its own section, but those section is is two of the scenarios <laughs> have some strong um they're not they're not like supernatural and. Well, one of them has flat out has monsters in it, mm -hmm. um, and um, like like monsters that that the players can see. One of them has actually a dungeon crawl through a a grounded um, uh, first rank uh, Spanish galleon. It, it wouldn't actually be called first rank because the rank system wasn't used by the Spanish; it was used by the British, but. By the English and and maybe the French. I forgot the French were using that that system, mm -hmm. um, but a, but a large ship, um, and um, and uh, yeah. So so there are supernatural factions, but you don't see them. You don't you don't. They're not well defined, um, and they are sort of freaky. And those are in two of the scenarios I wrote. And one of the scenarios that's being in developed now is more of a, of a traditional um, going out and, and finding treasure, uh, a treasure hunt type of scenario. And in the meantime, there's, um, you know, in the sort of sandbox tradition, we have, you know, advice for how the, you know, GM through doing this will have, you know, great powers or pirate hunters or double crossing pirates um, interact, follow and generally mess with the players. Mm -hmm. um, this, and, and I wasn't even going to make it very supernatural. All of our settings are very just historical, but the supernatural stuff, well, my players liked it and they wanted to, they wanted to go there. And so to a certain extent we go there. Mm -hmm. um, there is, there is a strong element of, um, potentially of of uh alternate reality element in 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 some of this um there is uh, there are there are uh i'm not so sure how much i should i should reveal because some of it is is maybe like the gm wants to keep it uh on the lowdown but there's there is a a curse that could that could befall one of the players um, where they are haunted by uh, visions of, they're haunted by visions of the best possible future that they could have had. And through that curse, they become jealous because they realize that they're not in the best possible future and that they're sort of lame compared to the best version of themselves. This is something that, that I personally obsess with mm -hmm. in my daily life. Um, and it was something that I was inspired um, by this TV show called Counterpart, um, and it was, uh, and I realized that through through this sort of, you know, just silly supernatural element, I can introduce things. At, I can introduce horror aspects into the game, or I can introduce uh, really comedic aspects into the game. I could give reasons why why the PCs can succeed wildly at things. Mm -hmm. Now, with now one of the things that was that's that's um covered under the under one of the stretch goals that you guys um, that you guys unlocked recently mm -hmm. is the skullduggery system. Yep. And I'd I'd be curious how that's how that's going to be working out. 
Well, um, that's two parts. Um, one part, which I didn't really explain uh, or mention, is is um, simply uh, a advising PCs, uh, advising the players to create a mate. Now, not a mate as in a sexual mate, a mate as in uh, a friend, a ship's mate that can that is related to the player and they can create a lore sheet related to the mate if they want they can create a character sheet for the for the mate if they want it's sort of like uh, i forgot what you call it in other games in other games uh, some games they call it henchmen or hireling or hireling yeah hireling uh it's not it's not so much of a hireling system um but i'm asking all of them to um and this is an optional rule, but I think it's a good rule. I think it's something that would be good for GMs to use to pick a, a, another person, another character on the ship and describe them. And you can describe it just as simply like, you know, just verbally, you could just, you could commit to it, to the, to the character and write a lore sheet describing a relationship, which will give you a benefit. You could create a, a character sheet. And if the main character dies, well, there you go. You, you play your hireling. So there, from there we have um, succession for when, the, for when the character dies. Mm -hmm. Now um, the skull druggery, rules is 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 really nothing isn't that special it's more of uh, advice but we the gm creates a list um with the list the uh the gm can create the list and put all the mates on the list and could also put other characters that the gm wants to put on the list and any and any player can spend one um, ability point from any pool that is related to, to to it to define to take a character off the list. Um, I'm big into uh, having uh, having the players at the very least have a lot of control over their own background and and NPCs that are close to them. That I find is in the the characters remit, and I don't and I I don't want to have anyone have the ability to override the player's remit with defining what their own character is and what their own special relationship with the special NPC is. Um, so they could, they can cross, they can spend a point to cross it off and then, and no one can um, spend a point to put that back on the list. But once those are off the list, um, you have a list of, of characters that could be suspect. So whenever things go wrong, not just through any one particular scenario, but through across across a campaign, whenever a ship, a, a hunter mysteriously knows where they are in the middle of the sea, um, whenever um, something fails, it may be a fail because of a roll, right? Because of a a, 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 a ability check, a test in, in gumshoe parlance, a test goes uh, wrong. Well, um, the GM has now has a tool to, to to suggest that maybe this was sabotage, and then point the the players to the uh, to skullduggery um, suspects, mm -hmm. and now we have a list of of six, you know, to ten or however many um, NPCs that they that the players will be interacting with. And possibly, you know, building up some paranoia about those those characters and dealing with that. So we have sort of a, a side, I wouldn't say it's a quest, but a side complication that 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 continues through the course of the campaign. Right. And I was trying to. I'm uh, sorry. Just, I was just trying to. I was. I was thinking about the pirate literature that I, the pirate fictional literature that I've read in the past, and you know, also the Black Sails TV show, and Treasure Island, um, and and other just thing uh, things of that nature, and thinking about about you know, uh, the the back and forth and the the pirates not trusting each other and. Um, and especially turning on each other when the pressure is turned up for, by the great powers. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was thinking about when I was creating that, that system. Yeah. I, oh, 
and now mm -hmm. now for something a bit less serious. Um, mm -hmm. I hope nobody's singing shanties at the table. <laughs> um, they they in, in, in my in every play test they were. It was always like two guys who were doing it, but yeah, <laughs> and that's that's cool. Mm -hmm. And I and I have uh, I had a uh, I I I played music too, like sea shanties music. It's mm -hmm. uh, but you know, um, I'm a sailor. I'm not a sailor. I sail boats. I know how to sail boats. I take my family on boats, and it's always a disaster. And uh, um, and I try to force my children into singing shanties, and and they hate it. And and I used to try to get my brother and sister to to sing shanties too when we go on sailboats. So, um, and it's always sort of like like when I go on boats, like my relatives or my 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 children are always like on the verge of mutiny. So, <laughs> well, either that you. I wouldn't. I wouldn't make a joke about something about somebody wanting to walk the plank, but not. But not nah, too easy. Um, <laughs> now, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count? Um, um, stretch goals, notwithstanding, of course. Yeah. Um, before the Kickstarter started, um, I was at uh, the project was at 165 pages, and then when I started looking at it, I was realizing that. Um, that I had forgotten to account for certain things that are going to be added anyway, and that increased it. And then um, uh, James Druger, who is who is uh, who worked out with us on the Journal of the Indochine, and is start in and he signed on to write a scenario. So right now, uh, it's looking like. 200 pages pretty comfortably at 200 pages this is a u.s letter size book so these are these are big pages um that's good about contact and that's to to me that's the the sweet spot that's uh, what um what i aimed for for all of our books actually mm -hmm. you could always like shrink the size of the book um and then you know extend the page count to like, whatever 300 um and you know there are some benefits to that um i do like having a big but big book and i like having all of our sons of the singularity books to be the same size so it looks okay next to each other on a shelf and so that when we do have art the art looks good mm -hmm. and what are you shooting for as far as a release window for the pdf version so we are when we go to Kickstarter with with all of our projects, well, this is not true. When we go to our Kickstarter with our product projects, our goal is to start the Kickstarter when we're about 80, 85, whatever percent done with the project um, based on what we ex have an expectation of what will be achieved in the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. So, um, this we we're not attaching like a Call of Cthulhu trademark to this, to this. We're not you know we are not we're not Wizards of the Coast. So I have expectations of of a, around the upper limit of of where this will go, um, and at most I I believe that there'll be two scenarios written but most likely one extra scenario written and a few extra uh uh big pieces of art we have a cover by jennifer lang which is really beautiful and we're going to have a lot of portraits uh so i'm trying to go for a very by our standards by what mm -hmm. it seems to be the kickstarter and our trpg standards a quick turnaround by our standards and well, oh, by by TRPG Kickstarter standards is what I'm saying. So I want to have a PDF in people's hands um, by by late February. So in about in about no more than three months. 
and I want and we're doing a drive through RPG fulfillment. So I wanted then I want to have that fulfilled and out uh, by the end of March. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're I, I don't know if this sounds like quick to you or slow to you. I don't know what what you know. Um, it seems based on the Kickstarter's I see um, fairly quick. Um, Journal of the Indochine took a lot. Our last project took a lot more, but we had you know our Kickstarter had done a lot more than we had expected and we were working with a with a with a much bigger team and a much more complicated project um this is this is a lot of the layout is done a lot of the the description is done we have our artists we have everything ready to go so mm-hmm. we're gonna finish it up All right and i i will i will certainly be looking forward to seeing the seeing the results therein but with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto my show and, and enjoy the madness that happens here in the temple. Oh, it's great! I, 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 I do feel like I've. I, and you say you said it's okay, but I do feel like I've I've been uh, talking a lot and, and not listening, which is which is not normally what I do, but. Uh, but um i'm i'm very happy to uh you're the first interview that i've done about uh, between the devil and the deep i did interviews for other projects like the sassoon files when it when china destroyed it and uh and general Tianqin, but i i haven't done any interviews for B D and uh you're the first one so i'm very thankful for it i appreciate that um oh. And of course, any time you see fit to return, the door is always open. Mm. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> that's that's good. Next time, I'll I'll take you up on that. It's 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 uh, almost twelve thirty past midnight where I am, so uh, not drinking tonight. But uh, next time, we'll, we'll, uh, maybe we'll, this will be a, a drunk, an actual drunk conversation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>